Okay, so let's let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming for the next and last in the semester meeting of the Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. My name is Paweł Gora. I'm a researcher from the University of Warsaw and uh, one of organizers of, uh, of this meetup. And today I will give you a talk, a lecture titled Adiabatic Quantum Computers. Um, the event today is supported by our hosts, Google. Thanks for hosting us. And uh, we are also supported by Daftcode, our strategic partner. Uh, today, there are no uh, people from Daftcode, but there are some gadgets from, from Daftcode. So uh, you can uh, take them if you, if you like gadgets. Uh, the agenda for today is as follows. Uh, since I know that uh, there are some people who are for the first time on our meetings, and then I will first give you a short introduction to uh, uh, to Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. I will tell you uh, why we organize this uh, this meetup, this event, and uh, later I will also give you introduction to quantum computing uh, and also quantum computers based on circuits gates. Um, so I hope that it will be good introduction to uh, people who maybe hear about quantum computers. Uh, maybe not for the first time, but uh, the uh, people who are just uh, uh, beginners in this topic. Um, finally, uh, I will tell about uh, the topic which is uh, the most important from the meeting today, from the perspective of our meeting, adiabatic quantum computers, quantum annealing algorithm, and its applications. Um, I, later, I will also tell you where to learn more uh, about this topic, because this would be just an introduction to um, to adiabatic quantum computers and quantum annealing. And finally, uh, we'll have after party, so there will be opportunity uh, for networking. Okay, let's start. Uh, Warsaw Quantum Computing Group, uh, as I said, is the eighth meeting and the last, the last meeting in this semester. Okay, it's the last meeting in this, in this semester. Um, we started organizing this meetup in November 2018 uh, to celebrate 100th anniversary of regaining independence by Poland, where the goal was to facilitate research, education, and applications of quantum computing, especially here in Poland. But we also record our meetings and um, make videos uh, available on YouTube. So we also would like to educate people in, in other countries as well. Our strategic partner is, is Daftcode, and we have meetings once per month. Uh, so far, uh, meetings were uh, at the Faculty of Mathematics and Computer Science at the University of Warsaw, just from Facebook, and now is the first meeting uh, here at Google. Um, yeah, the, the title of the first meeting was Introduction to Quantum Computing in general. You can see titles of other meetings as well. If you are interested in, in our meetings, in our group, you can join our Facebook group. We have almost 500 members already. Uh, or you can contact us by, by email. We have our mailing list. We have also fan page and YouTube ch channel where you can find video recordings from, from our meeting. All right, so let's start talking about quantum computing. Um, so people who are uh, experts in mathematics and computer science um, usually think about computations from the perspective of algorithms, and they compute um, time complexity or space complexity of, co of uh, computations. But computations is a physical process, so it's governed by rules of the physical world, which is quantum. Uh, so uh, we know for, for more than 100 years that the electromagnetic energy could be emitted only in quantized form. So yeah, we have Planck's constant, which uh, just uh, also influence what's the, what's the minimal energy uh, that can be emitted. And also there is a famous Landauer principle which says that there is a minimum possible amount of energy required to any logically irreversible manipulation of information. So based on the Boltzmann's constant, you can see that this energy is not, it's not large. But anyway, there are some limitations, right? So we cannot just do computations without a physical cost, without a cost of, of energy. Um, so uh, today, we just run computations on standard uh, classical computers, such as this, this laptop. But uh, Richard Feynman, uh, in a quite famous book, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, says that there's nothing that I can see in the physical laws that says the computer elements cannot be made enormously smaller than they are now. 
In fact, there may be certain advantages. Um, so probably you heard about a Moore's law, which says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circle doubles about every two years. So it's, it seems that uh, what Feynman said is, is true, right? So um, it, it doesn't look that there are some limitations uh, because the Moore's law uh, proved to be accurate for several decades and has been used in the semiconductor industry. But recently, uh, people realized that the pace of advancement has slowed. So now uh, this doubling of number of transistors is not uh, once per two years, but once per two and a half year. So the pace is slower. And even more in 2015 said that I see more slow dying here in the next decade or so. So two years later, Intel said that the trend will continue thanks to hyperscaling. Uh, but anyway, it cannot continue forever, probably. And because uh, if it will continue for next 15, 20 years, then the size of the transistor should be of the size of a one atom. And it's a scale in which the laws of quantum mechanics uh, start playing uh, the crucial role. So this is also one of the reasons why we should start thinking about some other uh, models uh, of computations. Uh, Feynman is also considered to be one of uh, fathers of quantum computing. Uh, for example, he said that now we can, in principle, make a computing device in which the numbers are represented by a row of atoms with each atom in either of the two states, so zero or one. That's our input. The Hamiltonian starts Hamiltonianizing the wave function. The ones move around, the zeros move around. Finally, along a particular bunch of atoms, ones and zeros, occurs that represent the answer. Nothing could be made smaller, nothing could be more elegant. No losses, no uncertainties, no averaging. But can we do it? So it was more than 30 years ago, and nowadays we know that potentially, probably, we can do it, uh, at least in a relatively small scale, because right now we are able to build uh, quantum computers with uh, more than 10 qubits. So soon I will explain what a what qubit is. And this is just an example. It's a, a quantum computing device uh, built by uh, Google, our host, uh, not exactly here in, in Warsaw, but uh, it's uh, just a product of this company, uh, which has 72 uh, qubits. And this is one of one of largest uh, quantum computer devices based, quantum computing processors based on um, circuits and, and gates. Um, so what's the, what's the now what's the difference between classical computers and quantum computers? In case of classical computers, I guess that most of you uh, know that we have bits and classical gates. In case of quantum computing, we have qubits and quantum gates. So bit may has a state uh, with a value zero or one, so it's just an element from the set zero one. But qubit may have state which is a superposition of state zero and one, so it can be. Uh, zero and one at the same time, or even something between zero and one, but this between is even something more uh, more uh, complex than, than we can uh, expect, because mathematically it's a unitary vector of the two-dimensional Hilbert space over complex numbers. Uh, in case of classical computers, the state is determined, so we can know exactly whether the state is zero or one, and it can be changed from zero to one, and vice versa. In case of quantum computers, uh, of course, we can uh, modify a given state of a qubit, but to get value 0 or 1, we can do a measurement which breaks superposition. So the probability of getting 0 or 1 depends on the qubit, which is this unitary vector. Uh, and quantum gates can modify uh, uh, qubits. And of course, the probability of getting 0, 0, and 1. So mathematically, that's, that's the qubit. So we have two pure states, which are orthonormal base of a quantum system, and A, B are complex numbers. Their amplitudes are probabilities of getting zero on one in a measurement. Um, multiplying uh, A and B by um, any unitary vector doesn't change the quantum state. It doesn't change the amplitudes. So A and B can be transformed to uh, polar coordinates. So in case of polar coordinates, we have such representation, and then we can interpret a qubit, state of a qubit, as a point on a something that is called block sphere. 
So in case of classical computers, we have bits, can, bit state can be zero on one. In case of quantum computers, qubit state can be any point on, of this block sphere. And we can say that quantum computing, or some people say that, say that quantum computing is just a journey on a block sphere because we have a given state, which is a point on this sphere, and we have quantum gates, which may uh, modify um, our point on this sphere, right? But, but we, are, we are still uh, somewhere here on this sphere. Uh, okay, and now why, why it is important? Because in classical computers on n bits, we can process only one n bit number at the same time. And using n qubits, we can process all two to the power of n n bit numbers at the same time. Uh, in case of classical computers, results are deterministic, so randomness is pseudo-randomness, in fact. Uh, but in case of quantum computers, we may have real randomness, and we can easily sample from difficult probability distributions, distributions which are difficult for classical computers. All right, and this is, this is just example of a circuit uh, in which we just built a superposition of two to the power of n, uh, n bit numbers. And then when we apply um, and when we apply operation, which is uh, another gate, uh, then we just apply this operation to uh, every uh, n, uh, every uh, each of these two to the power of n uh, possible numbers, possible states of our qubits. So these are just examples of classical uh, quantum, quantum gates, which may modify our our state. Uh, so, for example, Hadamard's gate is one of most popular because it builds superposition of zero and one. Uh, we have Pauli gate, which just transforms zero to one, one to zero. C -note, C note also interesting because we have two qubits and one qubit is a controller for not operation on the second qubit. And based on that, we can build such uh, nice circuits. So this is an example of a quantum circuit which uh, mm, which computes my initials, so P and G. So we have eight uh, digits, eight uh, qubits. Initial value is, is zero, and then we can transform uh, values of these qubits using our quantum gates, uh, so that uh, eventually, after doing measurement, uh, and with probability 50%, we receive a number or values, which are uh, the ASCII representation of letter P, and with probability 50%, we receive uh, values which are ASCII representation of the letter G, right? So I, I was able to compute my, my initials using this quantum circuit. All right, uh, but adiabatic quantum computers are a bit different um, because they are based on physical process which is called adiabatic process. Adiabatic process is a process that does not involve the transfer or heat or matter into or out of a thermal dynamic system. And in adiabatic process, energy is transferred to the surroundings only as work. Um, and based on that, uh, we can build something that is called adiabatic quantum computer. So here we, you have some uh, words which may look a bit difficult at the moment, but later uh, in my talk, I will explain uh, the meaning of most of this, um, uh, most of these concepts. So first, uh, we have a potentially complicated Hamiltonian, which is just a function which describes um, uh, energy of, a, of our quantum quantum state. Um, and uh, we found this uh, Hamiltonian with this function uh, whose ground state describes the solution to the problem of interest. Uh, so ground, ground state is a state with the minimum uh, energy. Next, a system with simple Hamiltonian is prepared initialized to the ground state, so also the state of the minimum energy. And finally, the simple Hamiltonian is adiabatically, so according to this process, evolved to the desired complicated Hamiltonian. And by the adiabatic theorem, the system remains in the ground state. So at the end, the state of the system describes the solution to the problem. Uh, so we have one state, which is uh, Initial, initial state and it's relatively simple. And then we do some uh, evolution of this system using adiabatic process so that at the end we receive uh, another function and the minimum of, of this function can be a solution of our problem. That's, that's the main idea. And it was proved that adiabatic quantum computing is polynomially equivalent to conventional quantum computing in the circuit model. So we can, uh, 
uh, we can simulate uh, um, adiabatic quantum computers using uh, using quantum uh, qu uh, circuit model and uh, vice versa. Uh, all right, so uh, we have now intuition that we potentially we can uh, the nature can do calculations for us thanks to this adiabatic process. So I will explain later how exactly uh, it works. Uh, but uh, we can also ask what might be the time complexity of these computations. Uh, so the time complexity for an adiabatic algorithm is the time required to uh, complete this adiabatic process, this adiabatic evolution, which is dependent on the gap in a, an energy eigenvalues, spectral gap of the Hamiltonian. Specifically, if the system uh, is to be kept in the ground state, the energy gap between the ground state and the first excited state provides an upper bound on the rate at which the Hamiltonian can be evolved at time t. So if we, if we want to uh, stay in this state of the minimum energy, uh, and, and that's the condition uh, based on which we can uh, claim that we found a solution of our problem, for example. Right, and uh, then the time of computation is can be uh, is is bounded uh, by this function, which depends on the minimum spectral gap, so the uh, the energy gap between uh, the ground state and the next the first uh, excited state. And uh, so, uh, some some people may say uh, that uh, okay, so if we can run these computations uh, very fast, then potentially we can. Uh, solve some difficult uh, problems, for example, anti-hard problems. But the problem with anti-hard problems usually is that uh, this difference, this ener energy gap after representation of our problem uh, may be very small. So in that case, the time of computation, again, may be very large. So prob probably we will not be able to find uh, uh, the global optimum of, of our solution. Or at least we cannot we cannot prove that we'll be able to do that. Um, all right. Uh, so, in case of uh, circuit quantum computers, we also have a problem of decoherence. So our quantum um, quantum state should be uh, kept in uh, isolation from the environment, because otherwise we may have a noise in our computations. Right. So our gates may not do what we expect, or our measurements will not do what we expect. Uh, and adiabatic quantum computers also can solve uh, this problem, or it's a method to get around the problem of this energy relaxation. Uh, because when the system is in a ground state, the interference with the outside world cannot make it move to a lower state. Uh, so. Uh, before I uh, describe in more details how these uh, computations uh, can be implemented, uh, first I will give you intuition how uh, uh, such model can be used to solve some difficult uh, problems, computational problems. For example, problems, com so-called combinatorial optimization problems. So uh, combinatorial optimization problems are family on, of problems in uh, which we search for the best solution. Uh, of many possible combinations. So uh, it may include, for example, scheduling challenges such as should I ship this package on this track or next one? Or what's the most efficient route a traveling salesperson should take to visit different cities? So as you probably know from computer science, the traveling salesman problem is one of those difficult, complex, and the hard problems. But physics can help solve these sorts of problems because we can frame them as energy minimization problems. So a fundamental rule of uh, physics and our world is that everything tends to seek a minimum energy state. Objects slide down hills, hot things cool down over time. And this behavior is also true in the world of quantum physics. And there is a process called quantum annealing, which is related to our adiabatic quantum computers, which simply uses quantum physics to find these low energy states of a problem and therefore the optimal or near optimal combination of elements. So in, in simple words, uh, using this quantum annealing and adiabatic quantum computers, we might be able to find minimal energy state for a given optimization problem, which is encoded as entanglement of qubits. So once we um, translate our optimization problem to, um, to, to qubits, the solution 
to our optimization problem is a state with the minimum energy, state of qubits with the, with the minimum energy. And since the nature um, tends to seek a minimum energy states, then the nature can just do computations uh, for us. Okay, uh, I told you about quantum, uh, about adiabatic quantum computers, and there was also uh, a concept of quantum annealing. So there is a slight difference because in case of adiabatic process and adiabatic uh, quantum computers, we just assume that we live in an ideal world, right? When there is, um, uh, we, we live in a perfect isolation. But in a real world, in a real world, it, that it, uh, it's almost no, not possible. So the quantum annealing uh, may be thought of as the real world counterpart to adiabatic quantum computing. So the, the difference, uh, the difference is uh, that um, uh, that poten uh, potentially during our computations, uh, um, our system may not be in exactly in the ground state, in the state of minimum energy. Uh, but it may move to another state. Uh, but if we are lucky, uh, then uh, again, after finish of these computations, potentially we'll be in a state which corresponds to um, to solution of our optimization problem, for example, which might be still quite good. Maybe not. It will not be the global optimum, but it may be still quite good. Uh, quite good solution. Uh, so and now, how how to uh, do such quantum annealing? How to uh, modify uh, our our quantum states? Uh, so in practice, we can do it, for example, by applying a magnetic field. So initially, we have a qubit which is in a superposition state, but after applying the magnetic field, we can just change this uh, landscape of the energy um, energy function. Uh, so first, uh, we uh, may achieve something that is called double well potential. And in this state, uh, assuming that everything else is equal, the probability of cubing ending in a, a state zero or in a state one is equal. So it's 50%. However, we can control this probability of falling into the state zero or one by uh, applying an external magnetic field. And th th this is this is in fact how we do uh, how we do computations. So we modify the probability of uh, uh, ending up in a in a given state. And uh, to understand how how it may work in case of more complex quantum states when we have more than one qubit, uh, it's good to uh, tell what is uh, the Ising model and later what is uh, Cubo. So first, the Ising model uh, is a Mm, concept from uh, statistical mechanics and or ferromagnetism, uh, where uh, we have qubits uh, with two values which corresponds to sp uh, spins. And we, ha we may have spin up or spin down, uh, which may correspond to values one or minus one. Uh, we have a relationship between our spins, which is represented by couplings, and there are also correlation, uh, correlations and anti-correlations. And uh, based on that, we can uh, express our objective function. So the idea now is that uh, we can couple our qubits in such a way that uh, when we um, write down this uh, Hamiltonian, because in fact, this is a Hamiltonian of the system, uh, then it uh, corresponds to um to description of of our problem and uh, after running uh, computations after running this adiabatic process uh, we may end up in a state which is a uh, minimum uh, of this of this function uh, where uh, our variables here are this s so these are just spins spin up or spin down plus one or minus one and we just want to find the assignment for these values so that this function will be I will have the minimum uh, value. Uh, okay, so uh, and uh, so Ising model is a model from from physics, but there is also a mathematical uh, concept which is a, a corresponding concept to the Ising model, uh, and it's called Cubo. It's a quant quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. So it's a cl class of optimization problems. 
uh, in which again we have uh, values, for example, uh, this time uh, true and false, so one and zero, not one minus one. Uh, and uh, we define uh, our function in a similar in a similar way, right? So it's uh, it's a quadratic function. Uh, so maybe not not exactly quadratic, but we may have just a multiplication of two uh, variables at at most. Um, so uh, we can represent these computations uh, using a matrix Q, which is a diagonal. Um, uh, no, it's not a di diagonal matrix, but diagonal, diagonal terms are the linear coefficients, and the non-zero of diagonal terms are the quadratic coefficients. Uh, so again, it's it's just optimization problem, right? So now we are looking for uh, values or assignment of uh, of our x, uh, so that the value of this function will be minimum. And if only we can. Uh, translate our optimization problem to this Kubo problem, uh, then we can uh, translate uh, this Kubo problem to uh, the Ising e model, for example, or to the state of, uh, or to our, our Hamiltonian. And then we can run computations on adiabatic uh, quantum computer or using this quantum annealing process. And finally, uh, thanks to that, we'll be able to find uh, solution so assignment uh, which will give us quite good solution to this uh, optimization problem all right so uh, uh, i told you about hamiltonians and in, in general hamiltonian uh, it might be considered as a mathematical description of some physical system in terms of its energies so those hamiltonians might be quite uh, complex and uh, in this ising model we build a Hamiltonian which is composed of uh, two Hamiltonians. So maybe you remember from this description of adiabatic quantum computer, uh, we have uh, initial state which is relatively simple and it corresponds to this initial Hamiltonian. And for example, it may be a state uh, or uh, in which our qubits are in a superposition of state zero, zero and one. So for each qubit, the probability of getting zero and one is 50%. And we have a final Hamiltonian, which should uh, correspond to our optimization problem. So we should translate our optimization problem to this final Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, then, as you uh, remember, uh, uh, we assume that uh, our uh, quantum system will be in a ground, uh, ground state with the minimum energy. And if we modify parameters, values of parameter S from the initial Hamiltonian, so from the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian, we may uh, just achieve the ground state, minimum, minimum state of this final Hamiltonian, which corresponds to our uh, optimization problem. Okay, so th this, is, this is exactly that case, right? So in this case, we have relatively simple uh, functions. So we have ground state, which can be easily prepared. And then we also have the final, final uh, Hamiltonian uh, in uh, which ground state, so uh, the mm, minimum of this Hamiltonian is the solution of our optimization problem. So we, we start from S equal to zero. So from the state of this uh, initial Hamiltonian, which we can easily build. And then if we change values of S slow enough, the final state will be the solution of our problem. So in practice, as I said, we can, uh, we can evolve our system so we can modify the values of S by modifying the strength of the magnetic, magnetic field. Um, so why, uh, how, how it's possible that we can be uh, in this ground state of our Hamiltonian uh, all the time during this, uh, the, during this adiabatic uh, process? Uh, it's, it is thanks to the quantum tunneling, uh, which basically means that when, when we just modify uh, in this uh, adiabatic evolution the landscape of our energy function, then thanks to the process of quantum tunneling, of, thanks to the phenomenon of quantum tunneling, we can just jump from one local minimum to another local or global minimum. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, if we do our, our evolution uh, slow enough, that uh, uh, that that we, we should always end up in a global global minimum. And thanks to, thanks to that, we are able to uh, just uh, do computations using this adiabatic quantum computers, and also find optimal uh, or uh, heuristically optimal solutions to our optimization problems. Uh, and now I will start talking about applications of this uh, computational model. Uh, I think that this is, this is one of most interesting and most popular applications. Uh, two years ago, uh, Volkswagen, uh, together with uh, D-Wave, um, conducted a research aiming to optimize routes of taxis uh, traveling from the city center in Beijing to the airport in Beijing. Uh, D-Wave is a, a, a company from, from Canada uh, which uh, just manufactures adiabatic quantum computers. And uh, probably that's the, um, I'm not sure, but that's the only uh, company which I heard of with, that works on adiabatic quantum, quantum computers. Um, a few months later, uh, I heard that Volkswagen started a collaboration with Google to bring quantum computing benefits to, to cars, uh, for example, even to self-driving cars. So I will also tell later about these uh, possible applications. Uh, but now I will uh, explain you uh, on this example of optimizing routes of a fleet, how this uh, quantum annealing and adiabatic quantum computations uh, work. Uh, so uh, there's very nice uh, paper prepared by the scientists from D-Wave and Volkswagen is titled Traffic Flow Optimization Using a Quantum Annealing Annealer. Uh, so initially, they built a road network, a real road network of Beijing, and they have routes from real GPS data. It's called, uh, they used so-called T-Drive data set acquired from taxis in Beijing. And then for each car, for each taxi, uh, they, uh, of course, they had information about uh, the route that the taxi uh, selected, chose to travel from uh, the city center to the airport, but they also artificially added two possible routes between source and destination. And they also assumed that cars may share road segments, but that the travel time is proportional to the function, which is a square of a number of cars on a route. It's a simplification because uh, in the real world, uh, this relation between travel time and density of cars, it's not a square function, but thanks to the assumption that it's a square, they were able to easily um, translate this uh, optimization problem to this uh, cubo representation, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. And the goal was to minimize the total travel time, so the, the travel time of all cars, of all taxis. So, uh, uh, we have several conditions, so that's the first condition, which basically says that um, every uh, uh, every car, so we, we know that for every car we have three possible routes, and this condition says that every car just selects exactly one route. And uh, also, they uh, we can build the cost function. Uh, I uh, explained that um, we have assumption that the tra time of travel on a given road segment is proportional to um, to the square of number of cars on a given on a given road segment. So that that's why we can uh, sum over all cars traveling on a given uh, street segment and then just uh, raise it to the power of two to uh, get a cost of traveling uh, traveling on a, a given road segment. So the the total the total cost is just a uh, sum of costs over all uh, street segments. And uh, we also add a condition which should, um, uh, which, uh, thanks to which we can be sure that uh, in the optimal solution, every car selects exactly one route. So if we just set the value of lambda uh, large enough, then we can be sure that uh, any uh, optimal solution, for any optimal solution, uh, this condition will be fulfilled. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, so uh, as, you, as you can imagine, uh, uh, in our case, Q, I, J are our variables. Uh, so they correspond to uh, X in our case. 
and uh, we can uh, find a matrix Q for which our ob we can just uh, represent our objective function as such multiplication, right? Because I explained that uh, in this objective function, uh, um, we have only variables uh, which uh, are uh, uh, have a, the power of at most two, uh, and uh, so that might be just multiplication of two variables. So we can we can we can represent this objective function as uh, such multiplication, right? So there there exists such such matrix, and based on that matrix we can we can build. Uh, so it's it's uh, this final Hamiltonian for which we would like to find optimal solution. And given this matrix, uh, we can uh, build the corresponding uh, quantum system uh, and run uh, run uh, computations, run this quantum annealing algorithm from initial state in which every uh, every qubit is just in a superposition. Uh, and uh, finally, we can find a solution that might be quite good. Uh, so the, the problem in general is uh, NP-hard. So we don't expect that we'll be able to find uh, optimal solution uh, very fast, but uh, scientists from D-Wave and Volkswagen were able to found, uh, find a distribution of routes uh, for which uh, the relatively small number of streets were heavily occupied. So we, we can estimate that we have uh, more than 400 cars, so more than 1,200 logical variables, and three to the power of 418 possible solutions, so very large space of possible solutions. Uh, so probably it's very difficult to find a uh, global optimum in, in that case. So initially, th that was the real traffic in Beijing, right? Th that's, uh, that was the real um, uh, distribution of, of routes, of taxis. And after 22 seconds of computations, so quite fast, quite fast, they were able to find solution which maybe was not a global optimum of our problem, but uh, it was solution much better than the real solution in the real world. So the, num the uh, number of streets with heavy traffic was relatively uh, small. Uh, another applications, uh, improving logistics, um, traveling salesman problem and similar NP hard problems in logistics. So vehicle routing problem, pickup and delivery, uh, van pooling. Uh, these are all NP hard uh, problems. Uh, and uh, there are already some algorithms which can be run on quantum computers and, for example, also uh, on our adiabatic quantum computers, uh, which can uh, find quite good solutions for those problems. Uh, so a few months ago, Michal Stenkel, who was a speaker on one of our meetings, I think it was meeting uh, in January, uh, developed a web application which is called Solve Quantum, in which it's possible to select up to nine cities, nine capitals in Europe, and uh, then uh, we can solve the traveling salesman problem uh, for these nine cities on a uh, D-Wave uh, machine on adiabatic quantum computer. So that's the uh, website of, of this of this project. Uh, I also recommend you uh, to read a blog a blog post uh, prepared by by Michal. But there might be also other applications. For example, in artificial intelligence. Uh, so here I uh, just mentioned some uh, potential applications of quantum computers in uh, in AI, in machine learning. Uh, and I mark with color blue uh, applications uh, in which, uh, or cases uh, in which I uh, heard about applications of adiabatic quantum computers and quantum annealing. So as you know, uh, Adiabatic quantum computers and quantum annealing are relatively good for solving uh, optimization problems. So I mentioned uh, that they are particularly good for solving combinatorial optimization problems. But uh, there are many optimization problems in, in machine learning. So in, in fact, um, most of machine learning is based on just uh, optimizing something. So for example, even if we train our neural networks, our goal is to uh, minimize uh, the loss function, to find uh, values of parameters of connection between neurons so, so that the loss function will be uh, minimal on a test set. But we, we, we train uh, our neural network on a training set. And also, in case of uh, k-means or k-medoids, 
Uh, again, the idea is to find uh, points. Uh, in case of KMEDO, it's points in our data set. In case of K-means, uh, points in our space. And then assignment of our uh, points from our uh, data set to, to this K selected points so that the total distance in a given metric will be minimal. So again, it's optimization problem. Uh, ensemble learning, we may have uh, many uh, relatively weak uh, models which are trained and then we can try to combine them to, uh, to obtain a more powerful machine learning model. And again, we may set different values of, uh, of weights and combine our weak models in different ways. And uh, again, it's optimization problem, how to find uh, parameters, how to find combinations of our weak models uh, so that uh, the final model will be the most powerful, for example. Uh, multiplying matrices, it's also uh, one of possible applications. Uh, maybe not, not that obvious, uh, because uh, when we want to uh, find, for example, uh, inverse matrix, and the, the finding of, of inverse uh, matrix is, uh, again, optimization problem, uh, or it can be uh, translated to optimization problem, because our goal is to find the matrix, uh, so that when we multiply it by our mat matrix, the result will be as close as possible to an uh, identity matrix, for example. So we can, again, we can translate it to the optimization problem. So you can imagine that in case of neural networks, at the deep neural networks uh, in, in particular, uh, the number of qubits that we may need might be very large, right? Because uh, we have millions of values of connections between neurons, and every value is represented on, for example, 32 bits. Uh, so we should have really large number of uh, qubits in order to solve this uh, um, combinatorial optimization problem. And we know that uh, on classical computers, we just treat it not as a combinatorial optimization problem, but as a continuous optimization. And that's why we use also backpropagation and uh, the gradient descent. Uh, so, but uh, later I will tell you about some other possible applications of uh, quantum computers and adiabatic quantum computers uh, to train uh, neural networks as well. So there are really many possible applications of adiabatic quantum compu computers, uh, more than 150 at the moment. Um, so, and there are many companies which use quantum, adiabatic quantum computers, uh, either installed in a laboratory or they use it as a service. So for example, even Google or NASA are also uh, users of adiabatic quantum, quantum computers. A few years ago, they just established a research uh, laboratory in which they test uh, adiabatic quantum computers. You can see Volkswagen here, for example. Um, yeah, so I explained that this qu uh, adiabatic quantum computers might be especially suitable for solving optimization uh, problems. So for example, optimal planning, optimal scheduling. Uh, this is interesting uh, example because in case of this scheduling problem, um, scientists from uh, United Kingdom ran some experiments which uh, showed that we can uh, achieve better results on using uh, adiabatic quantum computers than using um, gate, uh, gate based uh, quantum computers. Uh, and also, they expect that uh, quantum annealers and adiabatic quantum computers, which can solve the corresponding problem uh, in a um, uh, in a scale that is uh, required will be available in eight uh, 15 years from now but while in case of gate uh, gate model gate model so quantum computers based on circuits and gates we should wait uh, a bit longer so that that's the expectation and we'll see whether um, uh, whether it will happen. So we still have to wait a couple of years. Another applications, uh, distribution logistics, traffic flow optimization, um, supply chain optimization. So problems related to uh, logistics, demand prediction for, for taxes. Uh, so for example, uh, predict where, when, how many people would like to use a taxi. Um, yeah, uh, social networks. There is a, a, a area in the study of social networks called structural balance. So we have social network with sign edges. Uh, there might be bipartite nodes labeled by plus or minus. 
and uh, edges might be also friendly or hostile, right? And now given the edge signs, what's the best cohort assignment to nodes that tries to follow the edge rule? And again, it's NP hard problem, but there is an easing model equivalent to this problem. So there's also this cube of formulation equivalent to this problem so that potentially we can solve this problem on adiabatic quantum computers. Uh, NASA is using uh, quantum computers a lot, uh, for example, for cy cyber uh, security challenges, but also uh, they conducted research on using quantum annealing to fi uh, find the, the conflicting optimal trajectories for air traffic management, traffic management of, of drones, for drones. Uh, Volkswagen uh, used adiabatic quantum computers for uh, electronic structure calculations to find uh, good batteries for electric vehicles. And I also told you about uh, the application to optimize uh, fleets or uh, routes of fleets of, of taxis. Um, deep learning, again, machine learning. Um, uh, there is a research work, of, uh, again, uh, prepared by scientists from the wave uh, where they say that uh, their early deep learning models proposed networks which contained intralayer connections, so connections between neurons in the same layer, but proved to be intractable to train on conventional computer systems. We believe that quantum computing may offer a potential solutions with the ability to, to sample from complex probability distributions like those generated by neural networks that contain intralayer connections. So this is another approach, potential approach to um, train neural networks using um, quantum computers. But uh, most scientists believe that even if such uh, applications will be possible, and then uh, probably we'll mostly have uh, some hybrid models. Similarly, as nowadays we have GPU, so graphical processing unit, and CPU, and some calculations, some computations are run on CPU, some computations are run on GPU. And uh, that might be also the case in a world of quantum computers where uh, it might be reasonable to run some computations on quantum computers, maybe some computations on G still on GPU, uh, but maybe some computations will be still run on uh, just uh, uh, CPU as well. Um, predictive analytics in medicine, another application. Uh, that's an interesting case. Uh, there was a model uh, a model that has correctly predicted the winner of every U.S. presidential race since Ronald Reagan in 1980. Uh, and the model forecasted a big victory of Hillary Clinton in the past, in the last uh, election. And survey finds that Hillary Clinton has more than 99% chance of winning election over Donald Trump. So where did the models go wrong? And scientists claim that uh, there was a problem with sampling uh in a good way and uh they decided to uh build uh, deep neural networks using quantum computers uh to just uh find better estimation of of those chan chances and so they trained new uh, neural networks based on quantum computing uh, which were able to learn structure in polling data to make election forecasts. And uh, their networks gave Trump a much higher likelihood of victory overall, even though that state's first order moments remained unchanged. Okay, so finally I will tell you how uh, these adiabatic quantum computers uh, can be built. Uh, so again, it will be only on a short introduction. Uh, so probably some of you heard that uh, there are several approaches to build quantum computers, and we are still not sure which approach uh, may become the most successful in the future, because in every case, uh, there are some problems, there are some limitations. So we have ion traps, for example, uh, where the largest quantum computer has about 15 qubits. We may have super, superconducting qubits, probably the most uh, popular method nowadays. So I told you about the quantum computer developed by Google with 72 qubits, and it was based on superconducting qubits. Uh, we may have photon in qubits, uh, but these quantum computers are not large at the moment yet. 
And finally, we have these quantum uh, annealers, adiabatic quantum computer developed by D-Wave. So nowadays, in this adiabatic uh, quantum computer, um, we have more than 2,000 qubits. But uh, the adiabatic quantum computer, as you uh, as you saw, have you seen, uh, might be uh, very beneficial only in case of some specific problems. For example, those combinatorial optimization problems. But I also told you that optimization problems are ubiquitous, so they can be found almost everywhere in our world. Even finding the inverse matrix can be transformed to the optimization problem. And there's also another concept that is called topological quantum computers. So as far as I know, such quantum computers doesn't exist yet. Uh, it's but such approach is developed, for example, in Microsoft. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so how, how can we build uh, our adiabatic quantum com computers? Um, so we know that uh, we want our quantum bits to represent the lowest energy states of uh, superconducting loops that make up the D-Wave quantum processing unit. Uh, these states have a circulating current and a corresponding magnetic field. As with classical bits, a qubit can be in a state 0 on 1, but because the qubit is a quantum object, it can also be in a superposition of state 0 and 1 at the same time. At the end of the quantum annealing process, each qubit collapses from a superposition state into either 0 or 1, so classical state, and then we can read the solution of our problem, and our hope is that the solution will be close to will be global optimum of our problem or close to the global optimum. Uh, all right, so we know that we may have many uh, qubits in this quantum uh, processor, but it's also important how, how those qubits are connected. So this D-Wave quantum processing unit uses a lattice of interconnected qubits. Uh, some qubits connect to others via couplers, uh, but uh, not, uh, we don't have a full connection, right? So these qubits are not fully connected. Uh, instead, the qubits interconnect in an architecture known as chimera, and this chimera comprises sets of connected unit cells, each with four horizontal uh, qubits connected to four horizontal qubits via couplers. Unit cells are tiled vertically and horizontally with adjacent qubits connected, creating a lattice of sparsely connected qubits. So this is how uh, this architecture uh, is designed. Uh, but recently, D-Wave announced that uh, they are building the next generation, the next platform with more than 5,000 qubits, and it will be ready. They expect that it will be ready in the middle of uh, the next year. And beside the number of qubits, uh, they will also uh, introduce improvement related to qubit uh, coherence. So there will be less uh, noise, and uh, there will be lower problem with with the decoherence and interaction with the environment. Uh, even more recently, D-Wave announced that uh, even in a case of the current uh, state of the art, in case of this quantum computer with 2,000 qubits, they were able to lower the noise, uh, probably based on the approach that they also they are also going to introduce in the next uh, generation of the of their device. Um, and uh, uh, also recently, D-Wave. Uh, announced that um, these adiabatic quantum computers are now available for a public use. So there is a service called Leap, where you can register and you can just run your computations, design uh, your own uh, quantum systems and solve some optimization problems. When you, once you register, you can get uh, one minute of computations, but it's, it's a lot, so you can really run uh, thousands of uh, computations. And I think that you get this one minute for one month, so for 30 days. But if you uh, do something and then you publish your code on a GitHub, so it's if it's open source, then you can get another minute for the next month, and and so on. So if you are uh, if you are active user, then you can just uh, use this D-Wave uh, adiabatic computer for for free. Uh, all right. So I talked about uh, some benefits and uh, applications of these adiabatic quantum computers, but there might be also some problems. So there is a controversy. Many researchers remain skeptical about the long-term potential of such machines, whose approach differs from that of the other quantum computers. Above. So from from this quant uh, 
gate-based quantum computers. Uh, and the problem is that in case of D-Wave's machine, the quantum state doesn't evolve uh, slow enough. So as you remember, when I told you about this ideal uh, adiabatic quantum computer, there was an assumption that uh, this time of uh, time of computation uh, should not be uh, higher than uh, one over square of uh, energy gap between our ground state, our minimum, and the next uh, the next state. And in case of NB hard problems, this gap is uh, very small, so thus the required time of computations um, will be very large. So uh, we'll not be able probably to solve this NP hard uh, problems faster. Uh, but uh, because we just do this uh, quantum annealing faster, so we don't do it slow enough, uh, we don't uh, have guarantee that we find global optimum. Probably it will not be global optimum. Most likely it will be just heuristically optimal solution. But sometimes it can be still quite good solution. And also, if we repeat our computations many times, and we can do that because uh, we don't run it slow enough, we just run it faster, so we can just repeat our computations, it's quite likely that uh, we'll be able to find a solution that might be relatively good. So maybe it will not be the global optimum of, of our optimization problem, but still it can be a quite good uh, solution. But anyway, it's a controversy because uh, uh, the work of uh, so uh, the work of this uh, D-Wave machine is not consistent with uh, the idea of adiabatic quantum computing. Um, okay, so if the topic is interesting for you, I can recommend you uh, several uh, resources from which you can learn more about this topic. So, of course, website of the D-Wave company, which uh, develops um, adiabatic quantum computers, Leap service where you can just uh, try to solve your optimization problems using uh, quantum annealer. There are some uh, massive open online courses on quantum computing and quantum machine learning. Um, uh, on YouTube, there are very nice lectures given by Peter Vitek from University of Toronto. Also, there are uh, lectures recordings from, from our group. Um, there are several Facebook groups. Uh, one of them, Quantum AI, is, is run by me. So I established this group um, one and a half year ago, and there are almost 900 people there. And I think that all important news related to quantum AI are published there. So it's if you want to stay up to date, then uh, I encourage you to join this this group, and you can you can follow news from the world of quantum computing. Uh, another group, um, probably the the largest. There are more than twelve thousand people in this group at the moment. Uh, there is weekly newsletter, quantum computing re reports, so you can subscribe, and once per week you can receive also information about some new advancements in, in quantum computing and adiabatic quantum computers uh, in particular. Um, on 11th of July, there will be an interesting webinar organized by D-Wave. The title is Getting Started with Hybrid Quantum Programming. I think that you can still register, so I encourage you to uh, to do so. I think that the information about this webinar is available on uh, on uh, the website of D-Wave, and I also published a link on uh, our uh, Facebook group. Um, there are some conferences on adiabatic quantum computing as well. Quite recently, in, in June, at the end of June, there was a conference in uh, Eastbrook, adiabatic quantum, comp adiabatic quantum computing uh, conference. And uh, another interesting thing is that there is an idea to organize a research seminar on quantum algorithms, and it will be organized by researchers from Polish Academy of Science, Center for Theoretical Physics, um, Faculty of Physics of the University of Warsaw, Faculty of Mathematics and Computer Science of the University of Warsaw, and our Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. I know already that there are several people interested, so if any one of you would like to join, then uh, feel free to uh, talk uh, to me uh, during the after party, during the networking part. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. I hope that you liked this lecture and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thanks. Right. Any questions? One question? No. Okay. 
think maybe okay. Yes. Okay, may I ask some question a bit on on the solution of 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 the problems? Can this kind of computation can find the problem with something like non-trivial solution, which is something like entangle, entangles lattice, or something like that? For example, you can find something like singlet or triplet, which is a solution of something. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand. Okay, so okay. for given something like complicated Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay, if the system, I mean, if the solution of such system is some sort of entangled state, okay, so you cannot project into separate one, which is classically uh, realized by the readout, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, how can you do with that? Mm, to be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess that uh, probably yes, but I'm not sure. So we can I can check it later. Maybe Michal, you can I comment to so those ham those Hamiltonians? Uh, I guess most of them, the the, the ones that Pavel was showing, they're diagonal in the computational basis. So they're in a sense pure classical. That is to say, the the uh, the state that has the smallest energy would be a separable state. Okay, would be a, some state which is diagonal in some basis typically, uh, but it's just hard to find it. Right. So uh, it's. <laughs> Right, so it's not so easy to perform the optimization still, because you have still exponentially many possibilities. I mean, that's just a general remark. But there was some controversy that uh, D-wave devices are too noisy uh, in, sometimes, and the, the the states that you have there are like too classical. But it's another matter. Okay, any more questions? If not, then you, you can also ask questions during the after party, which will... Oh, one question. Okay. Thank you. Can we uh, go back to the Beijing? Uh, searching for solution by Volkswagen, just to refresh our not yet quantum memories from this slide. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me make maybe not question, but some presumption. If we use a uh, hyper technology to uh, solve um, a problem in a, in a not proper way, there is no point to use any technology in this way, What it, which is uh, maybe we shouldn't focus only on cars. We should focus on mobility. And mobility is uh, multimodal, which means mm -hmm. we can use more than one uh, mean of transport. Not only car, but uh, also uh, bike. We can go on our feet. We can go uh, by train. We can go by bus. And this is a searching of solution only focused on one mode of transport. So we use a uh, hyper technology for uh, not well defined problem. This is my not maybe question, but some presumption. Comment, comment, comment. So yes, y you are right. You. But I so uh, even even in in such simple case, the problem is very difficult. So I also explained that uh, the scientists had to uh, make very strong assumption that um, the travel time is proportional to the square of a number of cars, which is not true in the real world. But that was the only case in which, uh, that was the, th thanks to this assumption, they were able to easily just uh, transform this problem to this uh, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. So in, in case of multimodality, the problem will be even more difficult. So, uh, uh, but, but, but I, I heard, I think that I, I heard about uh, research works uh, in which, uh, People try to use these adiabatic quantum computers also to optimize uh, multimodal planning of, of routes. So maybe you can apply it in, in one plan in the future. But it's maybe maybe we have to wait uh, for many years from now until um, the this, this quantum computers will be large enough to to solve those problems without such simplifications.
just to add only one comment in a in a particular situation we have here. Uh, okay, let's let's uh, presume that uh, the question is how to optimize number of uh, uh, of metro trains, underground uh, trains between this station, Rondo and Z, and Świętokrzyska, the next station. And the solution is you may walk. Thank you. Um, okay, so that was a very nice lecture, which was presenting many possible applications where people have found ways of applying this adiabatic quantum computing to solve some particular problems. And what I've noticed is that it appears, to, at least to me, that the main challenge in using this technology is to translate your problem into the problem which can be applied to this kind of machine. So is there any effort which is trying to make um, to make some algorithms more general so that like let's say we can have some general procedure of translating any problem into the problem that can be solved on this machine? Thank you. E yes, uh, because I also said that uh, it was proven that this adiabatic quantum computers model is equivalent to a uh, circuit model. So uh, quantum computing ba based on circuits and gates. And uh, so th there are approaches to just transform uh, any problem to the problem that can be uh, just solved on this uh, adiabatic quantum computer but I guess that the co corresponding I at least I, I imagine that corresponding um, easing models corresponding Hamiltonians might be very complex and uh, so probably that that might be similar with uh, just uh, um, transforming our uh, instances of some uh, NP hard problems to some other um, NP hard problems, for example, right? So, so usually those uh, instances will be very uh, complex, artificial a bit, and uh, maybe so probably it will not, may not be very practical to apply such universal approaches. Okay, so if we don't have more questions now, you can, uh, you, yes. Just wait for the mic. The voice is totally uh, hi, Pavel. Do you believe we will have uh, personal quantum computers? I don't know, in 50 years, is it possible for you? What's your estimation about this? So, I don't know, uh, because maybe there are some and laws of physics which uh, may just say that it's impossible. So maybe we should ask people who are experts in, in, in physics. Uh, but uh, even if it's possible, then uh, many people say that our, the current state of development of this quantum computer technology is similar to the state of development of classical, compu uh, classical computers in 50s on the, of the 20th century, so 70 years ago. So we had to wait more than 50 years from this, those very large classical computers, which just uh, occupied almost the whole room like this, uh, until uh, we got personal classical computers, which we can just put on our table, right? And, and, and later we had to wait uh, a bit, even a bit longer for uh, computers in our watches or mobile phones. So even if it's possible, then probably we'll have to wait about maybe 50 years, who knows? Uh, but uh, maybe it may become, it, it may turn out that it's impossible because those quantum computers require very special conditions. For example, some of them require uh, very low temperatures and also a lot of energy to just operate. So, um, at the moment, I'm not sure, uh, but I, I believe that we'll need probably totally different approach to build quantum computers. So probably it will not, based on the approaches that are tried nowadays, when indeed we need to have special conditions and perfect isolation uh, from the environment, that might be extremely difficult or just impossible.
Yes. Let me have do you want to ask question or later now? Pavel, do you know if um, a short algorithm can uh, work on a diabetic quantum computer? Uh, mm, no. <laughs> so prob I'm not sure because based on based on this equivalence between uh, adiabatic quantum computers and uh, gate-based quantum computers, probably there is a transformation, right? Uh, or at least a transformation of a problem of just uh, factorizing large numbers. But uh, this uh, short algorithm as it is right now cannot be just run on this adiabatic quantum computer because it, it, just, it, it is based on uh, this gate-based idea. So it's it's totally different idea when we have to uh, need to have gates to uh, run quantum Fourier transform, for example. So it's totally different approach. Okay. Uh, so I think that we can. You, or you can ask more questions during the after party, which will start soon. I just want to let you know that our uh, group will return <laughs> in the future. So right now we have one uh, meeting uh, confirmed for October, and our guest and lecturer will be Professor Arthur Eckert, so a very famous person in the world of quantum computing. Uh, probably we'll also organize one meeting in September, at the beginning of September, about We'll see. So there will be, of course, notification on our Facebook group. And uh, yeah, so again, if you are interested, feel free to join our Facebook group, Facebook fan page, YouTube channel, mailing list. OK, and so thank, uh, thank you once again for, for coming for the event today. And also great thanks to uh, our host, uh, Google, to Marcin, and uh, also to Daftcode, our par uh, strategic partner. Uh, for supporting us, and now it's time for party and after party. Thanks.